Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Turn your King James Bible to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28 is one of the most, I consider one of the most important chapters in the Bible. So, without further ado, let's get on with it. Ezekiel 28, verse 1. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel, now, remember, Daniel used to interpret dreams. Daniel uh, was given oh, visions of the future. Well, dreams and visions. He saw the future. Daniel's another very important book. And don't look for me to do a uh, commentary on the book of Daniel because... Unless the Lord really opens my eyes, because Daniel to me is probably the most difficult book in all the Bible, my opinion. But uh, he says, verse 3, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasuries by thy great wisdom and by thy traffic, you know, merchant, merchants uh, trading and what have you, by thy great wisdom and by thy traffic, Hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? Good question. When somebody's getting ready to stick a sword in your stomach, are you going to tell them, huh, I'm God? I don't think so. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Now remember, circumcision was a something given to the children of Israel to be a sign of the covenant between them and the Lord, just like the Sabbath. 
Now here is where it gets interesting. Verse 11. Well, let me give you a commentary here. Verses 1 through 10 is talking about the human king of Tyrus. But 12 and on is talking about something entirely different. Verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum. Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, in mathematics, what is a sum? Well, it's the final answer when you do addition. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. One plus one equals two is the sum. Two is the sum. Verse 13, very important. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Oh, really? Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God? Uh, what human king, a couple thousand years later, has been in Eden? The answer is none. This is not talking about a human. Who's it talking about? Let's take a guess. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. What are tabrets and pipes? They're musical instruments. You know, pipes. A wind instrument. See, this being that had been in Eden, the Garden of God, was created, not born. Huh. What beings were created and not born? Well, if somebody says Jesus, they're a liar, and they don't know anything. Jesus was not a created being. Jesus had a created body, but he was not a created being. Adam was a created being, and the angels were created beings. Hence why they're called the son, sons of God. Adam is called a son of God. The angels are called sons of God, Job 38. Jesus is called the only begotten Son of God. Very big difference. So this creature that was in the Eden, the Garden of God, was created, not born. And you're talking probably, uh, you know, probably 3,000 something years after Adam. That's what my guess is. 3,000 some odd, you know, probably a little bit more. When Jesus walked the earth was probably about 4,000 years after Adam. Approximately. About. Close to. So, you know. 
All right, let's go to, I want to show you uh, that list of stones. Where is that list of stones that uh, this created being that was in the Garden of Eden, uh, where are they mentioned? Well, uh, I guess we're going to read Exodus chapter 28, verse 1. And thou shalt take unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. The Levite priest. Aaron and Moses were brothers. They were of the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi were the priests. They were the ones that were to serve God in the tabernacle and then later the temple. That was, that was, their, that was their job, period. Judah was the tribe of kings. So basically the Levites were the religious leaders and Judah was the civil leaders. So if it, you know, when it came time to tell people what the laws of God were, you know, the things to do, you know, like for the Passover and what have you, the Levites. If it was a question of uh, a crime like theft well then you went to the king you know there was civil and religious law and there was a time the united states uh followed that pretty much not anymore now we have the antichrist law and thou shalt and take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and Eliezer, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments, no, not garments with holes in them, holy garments, for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. The spirit of wisdom. See, the Holy Spirit was even working back then. Whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, and a broidered coat, a mitre, a mitre is a type of hat, and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue uh, in the Bible, blue represents the law of God. Uh, you think it's a coincidence that when you look up in the sky, it was, it was blue? Yeah, there was a time before they started spraying the skies that the sky was actually a very beautiful color of blue that represented the law of the heavens. It's kind of a sick, sickly looking color now. And they shall take gold and blue and purple. Uh, purple was from that uh, sea snail, uh, the Konex, uh, the Murex, M-U-R-E-X, um, and scarlet and fine linen. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue and of purple, of scarlet and fine twined linen with cunning work. It shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof, and so it shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod, which is upon it, shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen. Now purple's always been the color of royalty. So you got blue, the law, purple, royalty, and scarlet. Scarlet's a type of red, if memory serves me correctly. And what would that represent? The blood, right? And fine twined linen. 
And thou shalt take two onyx stones, and grave on them the names of the children of Israel. And no, not a grave like in a cemetery. Uh, like in engraving, you know, engra engrave, engraving, you know, you'd write it on the stones. Verse 10. Six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth. So it's going to go by birth order. Verse 11. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, thou shalt engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. Thou shalt make them to be set in ouches of gold. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod, for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel, and Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. And thou shalt make two ouches of gold. Uh, I was look, trying to look up ouches. I don't see it. I, I think it's pouches, but I don't know. Probably some type of uh, stone setting. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. You know, when you got a, a stone set in a ring. Yeah, so let's keep going here. Uh, and thou shalt make ouches of gold. Verse 14. And two chains of pure gold at the ends of wreath and work shalt thou make them and fasten the wreath and chains to the ouches. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. You know, skilled work. After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twined linen, shalt thou make it. Four square it shall be doubled. A span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. So, so a span is some type of measurement. And thou shalt set it in settings of stones, even four rows, four rows of stones. Uh, here's where we get to uh, where we talked about the stones in Ezekiel. And thou shalt set it in settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a ligure, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, and an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. Verse 21. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, Twelve, according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, every one with his name shall be, uh, shall they be according to the twelve tribes. All right, so let's go back to Ezekiel 28 and verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, Every precious stone was I covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. Now, where else have we read about this? Is there a place in the New Testament? Huh, let me think. Yeah, there is. I know where it's at. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Seems like I just read this. Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Yeah, I just read this a couple of lessons ago, but we're gonna we're looking at a different angle. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down. From God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, 
and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega. Why Alpha and Omega? Well, real simple. You ever heard of an alphabet? Well, that comes from the first two letters of the Greek. And alpha is the first letter in the Greek, and beta is the second letter. So instead of saying alpha, beta, they said alphabet. Yeah. And I think there's a Hebrew letter called bet, too. I'm not so sure, but I believe that there is. So, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. And Omega is the last. It's like a Z in the English. So, Jesus is basically saying, I am A to Z. I, you know, that's what I am. But it's in Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek. Don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. There's 5,000 partial manuscripts of the New Testament in Greek. You know how many Hebrew ones there are? Zero. Zero. And I've had people try to tell me, oh, yeah, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, you know who's got the Dead Sea Scrolls in the museum? The you-know-whos, and they won't let anybody look at them. Yeah, or examine them, because they don't want you to know anything. Verse 6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving. See, people, those that take the mark of the beast are going to be unbelievers. I don't care if they went to church faithfully every Sunday for 35 years. And threw money in that collection plate. And said, praise a Jesus, uh, and held their hands in the air and flopped around on the floor and spoke in tongues. If you take the mark of the beast, you're an unbeliever. You do not believe that God could provide for you. You're denying it. And I'm not talking about the... Um, the medical care that they're trying to foist on us. I'm not talking about that because I, I do not believe that's the mark. I think that's preparing everybody mentally for the mark, but I don't think it is the actual mark because it's not in the right hand or in the forehead yet. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers, the Harry Potter lovers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. 
Not that unholy Jerusalem over in the Middle East right now. No, this is going to descend out of heaven from God. Verse 11. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Didn't we read about jasper stone in Ezekiel and Exodus? Oh, yeah. Verse 12. And had a wall great and high. Wow. God's uh, holy Jerusalem has a wall. But if you listen to the people over in uh, Washington, D.C., they say a wall is, is racist. Well, what can I tell you? And had a wall great and high and had 12 gates. 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes 12 tribes of the children of Israel. There is no 13th Gentile gate. You are either Israel or you are not. But Chaplain Bob, my Baptist preacher said, well, I don't care what your Baptist preacher said. He's probably a Mason anyways. You know, they claim they believe the King James Bible, and then they tear it apart and with their doctrines. I mean, it's, it's disgusting. I'd love to be part of a church, but uh, they're all 501c3 government charter tax-exempt corporations. So there's 12 gates. And on those gates, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, there is no 13th Gentile gate. Verse 13. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Huh. I don't think Judas Iscariot is one of the names. No. I think it's Paul. Verse 15. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, and hundred and forty and four, a hundred and forty-four, just like the hundred and forty-four thousand, right? And hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. Now, a cubit is approximately 18 inches, about half a meter. Um, it was approximately from the tip of the index finger down to the elbow of a man. It's approximately 18 inches or half a meter. So 144 cubits, uh, that would be about, what, 70, 70 meters? I think, something like that. I don't know. It's a pretty high wall. You're not going to take a 30-foot ladder and scale it. No. All right, verse 18. Here is why I've been... Um, this is why I've been reading this whole chapter. 18. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. Uh, do you know crystal... Uh, like glass. Glass is a type of crystal. You know, you got crystals. The molecular arrangement of the crystals are all, they're all in a certain pattern, sort of like a formation. So it allows light to go through it. Do you realize this pure gold is like a crystal? Uh, ladies, have you ever seen lead crystal? 
you know, lead is like a, a gray color and you can't, it's not transparent. But if you take uh, lead crystal, uh, you can actually, uh, it's, you could sort of kind of see through it. Well, this is going to be gold crystal, crystal gold. And the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. Verse 19, here's where we start talking about the gemstones again. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedy, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophilus, the eleventh a jacinth, and the twelfth an amethyst. Just like in uh, Exodus 28, just like in Ezekiel 28. The gemstones of the breastplate of the high priest. The stones that were for the that created being that was in the Garden of Eden, uh, who was created. Same, you know, everybody says, oh, uh, we're New Testament Christians. I don't want to read that Old Testament. That's for the you-know-whos. You know, that's of no value to us. Uh, I'm going to be in New Jerusalem in the 13th Gentile gate that doesn't exist. No. People, when you look on my uh, videos, you see the Bible there with the two keys. You know what those two keys represent? One, who is Israel? And two, who is not? That's what those two keys represent. When you know who the players are and who the players are not, the Bible becomes even more a living book, at least to me. And, uh, of course, if you don't have the Lord, of, the Spirit of the Lord, it don't make no sense at all. So, so uh, in verse 20, you know, the twelfth was an amethyst. Verse 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. What did Jesus say about not casting your pearls before swine? And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the light, uh, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Well, the Lamb of God is the light thereof. John 8, 12, right? And the nations of them which are saved, what nations? The nations of Israel, people, the twelve tribes. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, I believe this happens at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. Uh, they call it the millennium. Uh, Milli means thousand. I think it's Latin. Yeah. Yeah, millennium, thousand. You ever heard of millennials? Yeah. So, did you know there's going to be a temple in the kingdom? Yeah, before the millennium? Well, during the millennium, there's going to be a, an actual temple. It's called Ezekiel's Temple. What? Yeah, we'll cover it. Well, God willing, we'll cover it. But uh, I believe that temple is going to be for the unsaved children who grow up in the kingdom during the kingdom, uh, the millennial reign of Christ. 
Chaplain Bob, what are you talking about, children? We're not going to have any children in the kingdom. Well, Jesus did say that uh, in the resurrection there'd be, uh, you know, we wouldn't be given a marriage. You know, we wouldn't have, there won't be any marriage. We'll be like the angels in heaven. Well, Bible does record that there's going to be a, a, uh, children in the kingdom. Where do these children come from? Simple. What about all the children that were aborted? What about the children that died in childbirth? What about the children that died at one year old? Does God send them to hell? No. No. Absolutely not. They're all going to be given a chance to grow up and decide, will I honor the Lord or will I follow Lucifer? Lucifer is going to be bound for a thousand years. Then he's going to be loosed for a little season to deceive the nations. And they're going to have a chance to grow up. And hopefully uh, the Lord will, I'll be, hopefully I'll be found worthy to be uh, one of the Bible teachers. That would be a great honor. And be able to teach the kids. Probably at least two of my own that were aborted like an idiot. But what can I tell you? All right, let's go back to Ezekiel 28 and verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes, excuse me, was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. What's a cherub? It's an angel. I've had people try to tell me, oh, Ezekiel 28 is talking about the king of Tyrus. Well, Satan was the power behind the human king of Tyrus. I mean, was the king of Tyrus created in the Garden of Eden? No. 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 That was Satan. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Covereth what? The mercy seat. You know, the Ark of the Covenant. You know, uh, Indiana Jones, they had the two angels that were facing the wings, facing each other, covering the Ark. I think Satan was one of them. Lucifer. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. What human being ever walked upon the holy mountain of God? None that I know of. Not the Bible records that I know of. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. What would happen if I walked in the stones of fire? I'd be burned up. Verse 15. Thou wast perfect. In thy ways, from the day that thou wast created, not born. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. Ah, when was iniquity found in this creature? Remember there was war in heaven? Oh, yeah. And that, my friends, is in Revelation 7. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 7 in chapter 12. Revelation 12, chapter 12 and verse 7. Revelation 12, 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, 
and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Sorry they got the boot. Well, I'm not sorry they got the boot, but uh, yeah. Ezekiel 28, 15. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Yep. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Well, what would a war in heaven be? Wouldn't that be violent? Oh, yeah. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Well, you know, what do you think uh, Eve was talking to in the garden? You know, a talking snake? No, the Bible tells you that old serpent called the devil and Satan. That old, you know, that old serpent called the dragon and Satan. You know, read Revelation 12. It tells you who the serpent is. Eve was probably talking to one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful, of God's creation. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Wasn't Satan called an angel of light? Absolutely. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Wow. Ezekiel 28, 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all of them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Wow. Verse 20. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Zidon, and prophesy, prophesy against it. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Zidon, and I will be glorified in the midst of thee. And they shall know that I am the Lord, when I have executed judgments in her, and shall be sanctified in her, for I will send into her pestilence, disease, right? Pestilence and blood into her streets, and the wounded shall be judged in the midst of her by the sword upon her on every side, and they shall know that I am the Lord. 24. And there shall be no more a prick, pricking briar unto the house of Israel. See, God told Israel that if they didn't get rid of the Canaanites, that they'd be, they'd be thorns in their sides. 
Oh, yeah. When the Lord took Israel out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land, he told them to kill the Canaanites, drive them out, get rid of them. Numbers 33:55. And of course, the uh, modern church world says, well, you know, God wants to save the Canaanites now. Matter of fact, they teach that we are the Canaanites. Well, you know, the you-know-whos are God's chosen people, and we're just a bunch of Canaanite Gentiles saved by grace that God changed his mind, you know. That's what they teach. Talk, ask John Hagee. He'll tell you. We're just a bunch of Gentiles. We're, we're a bunch of Canaanites. Numbers 33, 55. The Lord said, but if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, but if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. What did they... Uh, what did they put upon Jesus' head? A crown of thorns? Oh, yeah. Joshua 23, 13. Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more, no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until ye, until ye perish from off this good land which the Lord, your God, hath given you. Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2, verse 1. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you to go up out of the, Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league. What's a league? An, an agreement, a covenant, a contract. You don't make an agreement with them. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars. Yeah, throw down the altars of the Satanists. But ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare or a trap unto you. Oh boy. Back to Ezekiel 28. And there shall be no more a pricking, pricking briar unto the house of Israel. Now, we're talking about uh, Zidon here. Zidon, one of the Canaanites. Verse 24. And there shall be no more a pricking briar unto the house of Israel, nor any grieving thorn of all that are round about them that despise them. And they shall know that I am the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered and shall be sanctified them and sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen, then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob, and they shall dwell safely therein, and shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell with confidence when I have executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about them, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. Now, I believe this last verse that we just read, I just read, speaks of the future time, like what I read in, uh, what was it, Revelation 21, where it talked about the New Jerusalem. 
Yeah. And they shall dwell safely therein and shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell with confidence when I have executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about them. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God. Well, there you have it, people. I sincerely hope that you found this interesting and it edified you. I really, I hope so. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.